take the example of two individuals. One in Kenya, uh, a Maasai pastoralist, and if you know the Maasai, they, um, they live semi-nomadic lives, and for them, well-being is a matter of cattle ownership. And uh, the more cattle they have, it's a sign of, of wealth, and, and the life they value is living a semi-nomadic life in, in, um, in, in Kenya, raising cattle, and um, probably having some level of education. And, um, and then you compare, you have the life of a trader, that also values his life. He values the simulation of uh, of the risk of making money, of uh, of the life of being a trader. So, in terms of of Justin, you would say, well, both individuals live a life they value somehow. But but then you look at the collections. Well, the the Maasai pastoralist is actually now increasingly unable to live a life he he values because of climate change, because of desert desertification and, um, and long periods of drought. So the, 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 um, the Maasai is more and more restricted in his ability to live a life he values. So his, his situation is becoming more unjust. And um, what I would argue the idea of justice fails to, to uh, account for is the connected, connectedness of people's lives. And uh, it's not just a matter of individuals that the trader, by living such a lifestyle, contributes to an economic structure that, that, that rewards high risk, speculation, consumption, and increases the risk of climate change. And so this structure is then having negative impacts on the Maasai, who has done nothing to climate change, but is suffering from it. And so, in justice, you can see that it's not just a matter of individual outcomes, it goes beyond, beyond that. So the trader is part of this economic structure. Now, defined structure as something that emerges from interpersonal relations, but that becomes irreducible to them. And so, it's true that organizations and structures are made of individuals, but by the, the, um, the uh, interpersonal relations, they contribute to making something that becomes beyond them. Now the trader contributes to this economic structure, but he may be part of it, he might not even um, have chosen it. If He might be part of a culture that says, well if you want to be a successful man, you have to be a trader. You have to earn a lot of money, you have to consume a lot, you, you have to live such a life. And. Um, so this, um, this idea of structure I borrow from Hannah Arendt, and she says that there are three structures that are, that are conducive to, to human life. One is the cultural structure, which enables us to speak, to live a language, to have codes of conduct. Economic structure that ensures the survival. We need to buy food, we need to buy clothes, we need to buy houses, we need to work. And then political structure, which says defines our life in common, which is the proper realm of human action, of human freedom, that through politics we construct the collective life that that uh, that, that we choose. And um, if you link that with the idea of justice, you can see that injustice is structural at two levels. One is that this reasoning that is so central in the idea of justice depends on the wider structure. People don't reason from nowhere. They reason within the wider structure. And the media is such a powerful structure that defines what people value and, and, and what, what they reason about. So, yes, it, it's only individuals that value, but the way they, uh, that, that reason, but the way they reason and what they reason about is somehow part of a, of a wider structure. And then, the cause of injustice is also structural. The reason for which the Maasai pastoralist is unable to live a life he values lies in the structure. And what Hannah Arendt calls the perversion of structures, and she names you know, Zionism and, um, as, a, as an example um, of, well not Zionism, sorry, uh, uh, she names um, the uh, DSS um, and, um, and Nazism. That is as, a, as such a the perversion of a structure. But 
but you don't think of you know, apartheid in South Africa of being such a perverted structure that that defines people's lives or, or Zionism today um, in Israel. And uh, what happens with this, when the structures become perverted, it creates a sense of powerlessness. And, uh, and then Hannah Arendt has analyzed that very well, that, um, that you know, if you were a soldier in Nazi Germany, well, you felt powerless in changing the system. If you were living in apartheid South Africa, if you were a white person, you disagreed with apartheid. But there was no way for you to live differently. You went into a bus, you said you saw white, black only. You didn't say, I want to defy that. You had to live within the structure. You felt powerless as an individual. And the other characteristic of, of a perverted structure is that it can bring a sense of alienation. People might not even realize that what they do is bad. And this is what happens in, uh, well, in Nazi Germany, that uh, the Nazi soldiers thought they were doing their job. They couldn't see that what they were doing was, was something bad. They thought they were contributing to something good. Or, um, or in apartheid South Africa, people had come to see the apartheid system as a way of life, and they became alienated from, from, from the structure. So if we stay only at the level of comparisons between individuals, we do not capture the reality of the perversion of structures the reality of structural injustice. And um, this is why justice needs to go beyond assessment of individual outcomes. It needs to have an assessment of the structures in which we live. Because these structures can be good or bad. We need to go beyond individual assessment. And um, if we start to do that, we also realize that questions about <coughs> justice cannot be separated from questions about the good society. And uh, I want to take the example of, uh, of Zionism, uh, which I've become familiar with uh, in my trips in, in Palestine. Uh, and I think you know, Zionism is today the, the most striking example of an unjust structure. Um, people might not, might not even, you know, they live in such a structure that they don't even realize that what they create is so unjust, you know, to, um, and, and the impact that it has on, on Palestinians is absolutely appalling. Um, and um, so you know, the, the, the structure, you need to assess the, um, the, uh, yeah, the wider structural level of society. If you look only at the individuals, if you look at Palestinians' freedom of movements, you can say, well, it is unjust. Palestinians don't have freedom of movement. They don't have access to health, they don't have access to water, they don't have access to education because, you know, because of what they call the, the occupation. But what is interesting is that most aid agencies stay at the level of individual outcomes. They say, well, they don't have access to water, so we have humanitarian interventions, you know, we, or we, we, we have um, development aid. But no development agency questions the occupation, questions structural injustice of, of Zionism. Um, because it's too political. Um, and um, so I think this illustrates the limits of staying just at the level of individual outcomes without looking at the assessment of, of the wide structures in which, in which we live. And there is a, an interaction between people and structures. If you, you know, if you live in bad structures like Zionism, you are more likely to endorse Zionism as an, as an individual and, 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 and have a behavior that, that is harmful to, to other people, to especially Palestinians. Um, and so there is a relationship between, it, it, between the structures, whether they're good or bad, and the behaviors of individuals, and they are reinforcing each other. As a conclusion, you know, if you want to remedy injustice in the real world, one needs to have an idea of justice that is structural. It is not enough to stay at the level of individual assessment, like the Maasai pastoralist and the trader, or, um, or the Palestinians who are unable to, to have basic human rights met. And that means we need to have judgment about the good. We need to be able to say, well, well um, racism is a, is a bad structure. Zionism is a racist structure. Um, 
And interestingly, in the, in, um, the UN conference on, on racism um, a few years ago, they unanimously, um, uh, well not unanimously, uh, they, most countries agreed for, in the final draft to denounce Zionism as a, as a form of racism and xenophobia. And the Israeli and American delegations walked out of the room, and so the, uh, the draft was never, never passed. Um, um, but and, but no, we need to have this kind of evaluations that the political structure of Israel is, is bad. It is based on, on, on racism and we need to denounce that. And because uh, if you stay at the level of individual assessment of the impact of the structure on individuals, you feel if we stay at the level of the impact of Zionism on Palestinians, we will never address the structural problem. Um, but you know, this doesn't mean that there is a sense of powerlessness and uh, that, uh, that the structure, the, un the unjust structure, can be overcome through collective action. And, uh, and apartheid was overcome through collective action. Even if structural injustice might generate a sense of, of powerlessness, there is hope to do something together through collective action. And. Um, I want to come back into the three examples of, or the five examples of public policy in Argentina and how they relate to the structural injustice to the, and, and whether they, they, they lead to, um, to, to better economic, social, political and cultural structures in the country. Now to the same point about the ambiguity of, of Fenn's thought and corpus. And, um, and this is what makes his, its, its richness, is that it cannot be pinned to any specific um, philosophical thought. Um, and um, it's full of contradictions. And um, you, you, you first about to say contradiction within Sen about the fact that you know, his example of women's rights and slavery, well, these are such an example. But he doesn't go to the direction. He just leaves it open. He, he just gives them the examples um, in a very, um, very, um, how do you say, um, evasive way and superficial way. He will not have a thorough analysis of how slavery has been has been overcome. He will say, "Oh, that's an example of a good reason overcoming a bad reason." And so he always leaves it open for different interpretations. And um, and but what is um, you know what I was saying was not so much uh, a critique of the idea of justice, but just saying that it stopped too too um, too early. That it needs to go much beyond, and that he shouldn't it should, the idea of justice shouldn't be afraid of going beyond individual assessment. And I'm trying to go where Sam doesn't want to go because if he does that way, that means he will not be seen as a liberal. And and I think that's um, and, and that's that's a characteristic of, of all his writings. And he will he will always take something from 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 the, the, the opposition. <coughs> he will he will criticize utility, but then he stays with inconsequentialism. He will criticize. Um, he will uh, criticize liberal roles, but then he will he will stay very much within liberalism by saying that he has a freedom of approach. He doesn't uh, want to have a comprehensive doctrine of the good. And I come to you issue about intuitions about the good. Um, well, two things. The first is that the capability approach is based on more moral intuitions about what is worthwhile. And um, some of you who know the technicalities about the debate between Sen and Nussbaum, because Sen doesn't want to commit himself to a comprehensive view of the good, he just stops at this phrase, the reasons that people have to live a life they value. So he doesn't commit himself to say, oh, this is what you should value, or this is what is, is worthwhile. But you can see that underneath, there is some moral intuition about what is valuable. You know, living a life um, of watching video games, about video games the whole day, is not a life that is worthwhile. You might value it, but with the durability approach, it will say, well, this is not really valuable. And so through reasoning, we try to convince you that spending your life watching video games is not really 
a valuable life. Uh, so there is a tension here and about the necessity to have um, a discussion about the good society. Well, um, you know, I'm not saying that we should have the agreement about the good, but discussions about the good should be there if there are conflicts. And I follow very much the Michael Sandel. Um, some of you have read him, the um, philosopher, um, saying that you know, discussions about the good society are unavoidable. It doesn't mean that we agree on what is a good society, but it should it should be there. Um, and um, and that always the to your question about, about Marxism and dependency theory. Well, in some ways, yes, by, by going to some structural analysis, we are seen as kind of Marxist. And, uh, but uh, but it's, it is not within the Marxist framework. No, it doesn't. It's, um, it sits very much within as well the, I would say the liberal mindset, but it doesn't question the economic order in the same way as, as Marx did. And, um, and I think this is what, yeah, what constitutes the, 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 the appeal of Sen, this is why he's so popular. Because he appeals to Marxists, because you can see that he certainly is open to you know, structuralist, neo-Marxist interpretations. And then he appeals to the liberals, and he appeals to the economists, because like, his theory is so wide. Um, but whether it can contain such, such a variety where the consistency is, is, is not really clear. Uh, and I think that this is probably a reason for which Sen is always very economical with real life examples, really the nitty gritty of, of politics, um, because because that that means that his wide ranging theory is cannot really hold all these different um, views, like you cannot hold liberalism, virtue ethics, and Marxism uh, uh, together.